So our uh, focus for today is just to, we're going to share some information about the type of things that might be stressful for children and adolescents and some of the things that you may be noticing with your children um, and, and just some things that children tend to show us when they are in need of support. We're also going to talk about ways that you can access services in the community, as well as the mental health services that we provide within the school setting here at the School District of Philadelphia. Just a few agreements um, during our session. You know, we hope that you agree to be present with us, to participate and engage. Um, please feel free to ask questions and share your thoughts and opinions with us so that we can all learn from each other. Um, we'll make sure to monitor the chat. You can certainly unmute um, if you have a comment or a question that you would like to ask. Um, and of course, if you're comfortable, feel free to keep your video on. Um, and finally, we're all just going to agree to maintain respect and honor each other's privacy because we will be discussing some sensitive information today. Um, so they are kind of the agreements that we ask um, for this session this morning. So to start us off, I wanted to share with you um, an example of a breathing technique that both children and adults can use when they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed. Um, this is a technique that we often use with our students um, in our schools, um, and it's called roller coaster breathing. Um, it's called roller coaster breathing because the way that it works is that as you kind of go up your hand, which is we're going to use as like an example of I'm going to use this hand as an example of a roller coaster. As you're going up, you're going to breathe in. And as you kind of go down the hill, you're going to breathe out. And it really just helps us kind of regulate our breathing when we're just feeling stressed or when we're feeling overwhelmed in that moment. It can really kind of help to recenter us. So I'm just going to practice with you and, and please feel free um, to try it out as, as we're doing it. So as we go up, we're going to breathe in. And then you're going to release. And then you're going to breathe in again. And then release. And then again. And release. And again. And release. And one last time, breathe in and release. So doing an exercise like roller coaster breathing can really help regulate our heart rate. It can kind of recenter us and and just kind of bring us back um, to the present moment. It, it's it's definitely helpful um, in situations where you're just feeling really anxious or stressed or just kind of need to recenter. So. Just wanted to share that to kind of get us going as one of the techniques that we also share with our students. So let's discuss things that we know about mental health and how it's affecting students in our district. We know that since the pandemic ended, there has been a substantial increase in mental health needs for students as they return to in-person learning. We also know <clears throat> that there's been an increase in the severity of some of the behaviors that we are seeing our students display. Um, this include, includes an increase in what we like to call internalizing behaviors, things that we necessarily might not be able to see at all times, like anxi anxiety or withdrawn behaviors. And we'll talk about those uh, a little bit more as we go on. We also know there's continued societal stresses that are having an impact on all of us, including our children. There are things like the economic and political climate and how gun violence has impacted our city. Finally, we're also aware that there is a shortage of clinicians in the Philadelphia area who are able to provide services for the increased mental health needs that we are seeing um, with our youth and our adults. All of these issues have had a huge impact on our students and our families. So when we think about sources of stress in our children and adolescents, you know, we, we know for us as adults, if, if I were to ask you to list some of the things that cause you stress or stress you out, we would each be able to rattle types of things off. 
And I, I think sometimes as adults, when we think about our children being stressed, a lot of times we think, well, what do they really, what do they really have to be stressed about, right? Like we're the adults, we're taking care of the household, we're paying the bills, we're we're doing all of those things. But what we what we know is that children are largely affected by the environment around them. They're extremely sensitive to the stress of the adults in their lives, and they are likely to be stressed if the adults in their home or even in their school settings are feeling stressed. Children can also be impacted by transitions, even like a positive transition, like switching, moving to a new home or um, going back to school or switching schools, even going on a trip. Um, something that we might view as really positive can cause um, a level of stress in, in youth that we don't expect. And all of those things can lead to potential changes in behavior. In addition to school stress, <clears throat> children also, as we know, are stressed by peer-related issues as well. Those stressors that students feel as children, um, they remain, but they can become more complicated as they grow into adolescence and adulthood. Their social relationships play such a large role in their lives, and that can be both the cause of their stress, and it also could be a factor that helps alleviate their stress. Depression and anxiety in youth often look like irritability and anger. Um, it's important to know that underneath a lot of the anger you may be seeing in your own children or children that you're around is really stemming from the level of sadness. Um, if you notice a change in how your child usually acts, changes such as like eating habits or sleeping habits or playing, that may be a sign that they are stressed. Additionally, you may find that there's been a change in your child's motivation, either with their schoolwork or chores that you expect them to do at home. Stress can also affect the body in ways. So you may see your children having more complaints of stomach aches, headaches, or just overall kind of continued illness. So thinking about what we shared about youth, I'm going to ask you to kind of think about how you feel or act when you are stressed. What are some of the changes that you notice in your body, in your personality, in your interactions with others? I'm going to ask you to feel free to share out with the group, or you can place it in the chat if you prefer not to kind of verbally share. I know for myself, when I'm stressed, I can feel it like in my neck. I can feel it in my chest. It gets like very tense. Um, just a lot of kind of pressure. I, I definitely respond physically um, um, to stress. I also get a lot of like scattered thoughts. And yep, I see in the chat racing thoughts when stressed. Um, anybody else, anything that you would like to share? You, you don't have to, but you are welcome to. Um, just ways that you kind of feel or act when, when you are stressed. You may be stressed and you might be a little more irritable. You might be tired, um, a little bit more tired. Stress can certainly impact um, just your overall well-being. Um, so lots of different ways. Okay, we can move on. Nope, I see a couple more in the chat. I can't sleep. Yep, I definitely have issues with my sleep as well when when I am feeling stressed. I don't want to talk. That's Yeah, absolutely. Um, difficulty breathing, yes. All signs that we are experiencing stress. So sometimes we will put behaviors into two, type of, two types of categories. Internalizing behaviors are behaviors that we may notice in students that are more kind of about themselves. Like these are things like a student may appear sad. They might be withdrawn from their peers. They might not want to play with other kids or maybe they don't have a lot of friends or don't want to interact a lot. They might seem kind of worried. Um, maybe they've started eating and sleeping more or less. Um, they are what we would consider to be in internalizing behaviors. For externalizing behaviors, they're more so behaviors that can have an impact, a direct impact on others. So they could be disruptive behaviors like yelling, being confrontational. Um, it can escalate to aggressive behaviors such as like hitting or throwing things, fighting, having tantrums. These are categories that can sometimes help in us understanding what a child is experiencing so we can identify the best type of intervention to, to support them. 
in addition um, to things that you might see, there may be other things to consider when we're thinking about what might be going on for our children. They may have had experiences that are affecting their ability to cope. Sometimes children may go through a trauma or a stressor and not have any significant appearance of stress. At other times, children might be reacting strongly to something that we may not think should be, as adults, should be so stressful. It's important to note that children respond differently to different situations, and our best way to move forward is to help them feel safe and supported. There may be circumstances that may be leading to your, uh, a child's behavior that we might not think about. Those things could include being self-conscious about what their hair looks like, or maybe their clothes. Maybe they didn't get a good night's sleep. Maybe they're hungry. Um, children can also be affected by circumstances that are completely out of their control, like their living situation, or maybe they're experiencing conflict between the adults in their lives, or maybe they've experienced a few transitions. Of course, um, there are all these societal factors and bias that children experience that will also vary based on um, their culture identity. So we want you to think about like what you are seeing or you have seen in your children. Um, if you feel comfortable, we're going to ask you to share some of those things. You can either unmute yourselves or share something in the chat. Just some things that you see or, or have seen um, with your children. Um, I know with my own daughter, um, when she gets really stressed and, and experiences, she gets very like hyperactive. She's always wants to talk. She, she's always kind of nonstop going. My son is the complete opposite. When he gets stressed, he gets very quiet. Um, he gets kind of withdrawn. He doesn't want to talk. Um, so it's interesting for me to, I kind of have two kids that experience the complete opposite, um, when they're kind of experiencing stress, wants to cry a lot. Yep. Quiet in her room. My son is nervous. Yes. I've experienced those with my children as well. Fighting. Yes. Some kids uh, like to externalize when they're experiencing these behaviors, um, because sometimes they don't know how to really manage those emotions and their only way to do it is to let it out in a physical way. And that can be through crying. That can be through fighting or aggression or, you know, some kids will break things. Um, all, you know, they all respond differently um, because they're all trying to kind of figure out what those feelings are that they're experiencing and, and how to express them and, and, and get support. Thank you for those um, who shared for, with that. So now I'm going to share some information about the mental health, uh, mental and behavioral health supports that we do have available in our schools. When we first think about supports that are available, I, I want us to first think about where are all the places that children can access these supports. So when a child needs mental health services, how can they access them? So one of the things that um, there are these are some of the ways, I'm gonna put them all up here on the screen. These are some of the ways that families can access mental health support in the community. Oh, I'm sorry. Families can always call the number on the back of an insurance card and request mental health support that way. You can also call um, Community Behavior Health, which is, which is the agency here in Philadelphia that sponsors all of the mental health agencies across the city. They can always link you for mental health support. There is also a mobile crisis team um, that can actually come to your home and meet with you and provide support when in crisis. I'm going to share more about that um, at the end of the presentation, um, closer to the end. Um, there's also crisis response centers in the Philadelphia area where you can take your child to get emergency evaluations and treatment. I'm going to share more information about those as well. Um, similarly, at any time, you can go to an emergency room and seek support if you feel that your child is in crisis. And finally, you can always contact local mental health agencies, your primary care physician. There's a lot of ways to access those services um, in the community. So, But no matter how you are connected, we always want to ensure that we're increasing um, the interaction between the service that your child is receiving and the school. Because as we know, your children spend a lot of their time at the school in the, during the school day. Um, you know, 
our kids are in school six hours, six, seven hours a day. Um, so it's really important that wherever you're accessing those services, that your um, that provider is somehow linked to the school because we want to ensure that the school is providing support as well. So what does that support look like in a school? So on this slide, these are some of the supports that are provided in the school setting. We're actually going to kind of dig in and review each of these just so you're familiar with the help that's out there. We're going to start with counselors. School counselors in every single one of our schools here in the district, we have at least one school counselor. Many schools have multiple. In addition to providing counseling services for your students, which can look like working with them individually, working with them in a small group, and working with them at the classroom level. Counselors also coordinate what we call the multi-tiered system of support, MTSS. You may have heard that at your schools. You may have heard that in another training. I'm going to talk to you on the next slide just a little bit more about what that is. But the counselor really is the go-to person in the school whose whole job is to ensure that their students are receiving the services and supports that they need so they can learn successfully. Count school counselors are trained to identify and remove barriers that students are experiencing. They're trained to work with families to identify what supports and services are most appropriate. They are able to assist you with referrals for supports that your children can receive in the school building, referrals that your student, your children can receive outside of school. Counselors really should be your starting point for when you feel that your child is experiencing barriers. Um, toward the end of the presentation, I'm gonna show you how, if you're not familiar with how you, who your counselor is, I'm gonna kind of show you um, how you can find out that information uh, very easily. I mentioned um, MTSS on the previous slide. I just wanted to give you a little more further insight into what that is. So MTSS is a framework that schools use to identify students who might be struggling. So every school provides students with services and supports at tier one. So tier one is what all kids are receiving. So you might be familiar with like school-wide interventions or services that might be happening in your schools. A lot of schools have PBIS systems where kids can earn points and they can, you know, trade those points in for like perks or prizes. Um, your school might have school-wide attendance initiatives um, where they're encouraging students to attend 95% or more, and they might have like reward parties and things of that nature. So tier one is what everyone else, everyone is receiving. There might be students who need a little bit more, and that's where two, tier two comes in. Tier two is more specialized interventions for students who might be at risk for academic or behavior concerns because what's being provided at tier one is not enough for them. At tier two, this is where we can look at some options. Um, we can look at small group counseling and some of the other interventions and programs that I'm gonna talk to you about in the next couple slides. And then tier three is what we call the most intensive tier. That is the tier for students who are really experiencing ongoing, intensive, chronic behavior or academic needs. At tier three, we are looking for what are some of the referral processes that we have in place? What are the providers that are connected with the school? What can we provide for that student and that family in, in the school setting and in the home as well? So that's just kind of an idea of what MTSS is. School counselors will use these tiers to help identify students who are struggling and identify the interventions that are most appropriate for them. I mentioned that our office oversees Section 504 compliance. If you're not familiar with what a 504 uh, service agreement or 504 plan is, a 504 plan is one option that's available to help a student who has been diagnosed with a mental health or medical issue. A 504 plan allows for accommodations and services to be put into place for a student when it's a situation that they might not qualify for an IEP. So a 504 is a plan for students who do not need special education, they do not need specialized instruction, but they still need some accommodations and services so they can be successful in the school environment. Examples of 504 accommodations that can be provided are um, extended times, a complete a test or an assignment, 
could be um, a child who has asthma and needs access to an elevator, might be a child who has diabetes and needs time to test um, their levels and, and see the nurse. Um, it could be a student who is experiencing anxiety, especially when it comes to safe standardized tests like the PSSA, and they can get um, accommodations to have that test in a smaller setting or get have more time to complete it. So there's lots of different accommodations and services that can be provided through a 504 plan. Um, if you are interested, if you have a child currently who has a diagnosed mental health or medical issue, or you feel that they may have an undiagnosed mental health or medical issue, um, you can consult with your counselor or your school nurse. Um, if it's a medical issue, your school nurse um, would be the one who would create the 504 plan. And if it is a behavioral health or mental health issue, um, your school counselor would be the one that you would um, go come into contact with for that. So Megan, uh, when we talk about the diagnoses themselves, okay. what what are some examples of what those diagnoses could be for our so, families that might not be as familiar with it? Great question. It is an unending list, I will say that. Um, I will tell you some of the most common ones that we see on the medical side, we see things that can be a student who maybe has exper uh, experienced a concussion. Um, it could be a student with a broken arm. It could be a student who's receiving treatment for a long-term illness. It could be a student who has, I mentioned diabetes, I mentioned asthma, um, you know, things of that nature. On the mental health, behavioral health side, we have students that have 504 plans for depression, for anxiety, for ADHD, um, for eating disorders, for um, oppositional defiant disorder, um, there's just so many things um, that really can be covered through the arch of a 504 plan. The other um, great thing about a 504 plan is that 504 plans are agreements that can transfer into um, the uh, post-secondary world as well. Um, they had they are because they are required through um, the Office of Civil Rights um, and um, the ADA they are companies are required to provide uh, 504 service agreements for adults as well so whereas an iep typically ends when a child turns around 23 a 504 plan is something that can literally be with you for for life um, as long as you really need those accommodations and those services so it's just something to consider um, if you do have a student who's experiencing um, a diagnosed mental health or medical issue it's a great way to give you some protections and support um, connected with the 504, the Section 504, we also have a program here in the school district partnered through the state, which is called Brain Steps. Um, Brain Steps is a program that assists students who have experienced a traumatic brain injury, um, including concussion. We have seen, we always see a rise in the fall months currently um, because this is football season. So we end up getting a lot of students who are football players and cheerleaders who are experiencing concussions. So Brain Steps is a program that we can link them to. Um, basically what happens is you um, get linked to um, a case manager um, who will work with you, your child, your physician, and the school to determine what's the best plan for them in school, if it's a, an injury that's substantial where they need to be out of school for a time being. They can work with you to figure out what that looks like. They can work with you on the transition back to school. Um, so Brain Steps is a, is a great program specifically for um, students who have uh, experienced a brain injury. Um, but a lot of folks don't know that this exists. Um, so hopefully this is not a service that you will ever have to use. But if your child does experience something of this nature, this is something that uh, could be really beneficial. We also have a program called STEP in our schools, which is the Support Team for Educational Partnership. Um, the STEP program is available in some of our schools. Um, right now, it's in 46 schools across the district. It started in uh, 2017 in 21 of our schools. Um, and now I mentioned STEP 46. The STEP team 
basically um, is a team that includes clinicians, case managers, and family peer specialists that work to engage students and families in various forms of therapy, as well as case management and consultation. Stepsafe can provide individual group and family therapy in both the school and the home setting. Um, so it is a great program. We, you know, we are hoping to expand it to all of our schools at some point um, and that we continue to see growth. If you are curious if STEP is available in your school, I'm going to put that slide up for a second. That will show um, the 46 current schools that the STEP program is available in. Um, if it is not in your school right now, hopefully it will be um, as we are continuing to work to add um, those programs. Another available program is what we call SAP or Student Assistance Program. This is actually a statewide program that provides both mental health and substance abuse assessments for students in all schools. The great thing about this program is that it does not require any particular type of insurance. It does require consent from the parent, regardless of age of the student, um, in order to conduct the assessment. So what a SAP referral does is if a counselor um, or other staff identifies that a student might be experiencing some barriers and they're really trying to figure out what's going on, um, they might reach out to you as the parent and recommend a SAP referral. What will happen is um, if you consent, they will submit the referral and then a SAP assessor will meet with both you and your child to just really talk about what's ha what's going on? What are you experiencing in the home? What, what are some of the barriers that you and your child are facing? And then they will come up with a plan um, that will make recommendations, whether that's for treatment, whether that's for social services. Um, there's a lot of things that the SAP assessor can kind of create in partnership with you and your student to help remove some of the barriers that you might both be um, experiencing. So this is another service that you would um, access through your school counselor. And then each of our schools have a program called Intensive Behavioral Health Services, which we refer to as IBHS. The IBHS program means that we have a mental health provider in every one of our schools that provides support for students in the school, the home, and in the community. Services under IBHS can range from having a behavioral consultant that will support your student's behavior in the school setting and plan some interventions. There might be a mobile therapist who provides individual group and family therapy. There might be a behavioral health technician who works with your child in their classroom to provide support for behaviors. So it really truly depends on the needs of your students and what it is felt that they would, would most benefit from. One advantage of being, another advantage of being part of the IBHS program is that these providers can also help to manage medications as part of their services if that is something that you want to explore for your child. Um, this is a service that is provided through community behavioral health. It does require medical assistance insurance. The counselors in your schools, if you have private insurance or you do not have medical assistance, they can actually work with you to try to obtain that insurance um, for your child so they're able to receive some of the services under this program. Um, so this is a great program. It's now we're going into, I think we're in year four of this program. Um, like I mentioned, this is available in every single school. And again, it's something that if you're interested in, you would have this conversation with your counselor and they can kind of work you through that. And then um, I mentioned that um, sometimes it might just be the case that your, your child needs to participate in a small group. Over the past few years, we have been trying to increase our availability of small group interventions for our school counselors and other staffs to use. Um, we've really been focused on interventions that are supporting things like um, when students have experienced trauma or students that are experiencing anxiety. We also have some programs that will promote resiliency and teach your children some skills to help um, regulate their emotions and so forth. Some of the pro programs that we currently have in the school district are listed on the screen in front of you. ComCat is um, an anxiety-based program. It really teaches kids to kind of identify the symptoms that they're experiencing of their anxiety 
and how to um, some strategies and tools to put into place when they are kind of going through those moments. CBITS is a trauma informed um, small group. Bounce Back is also anxiety based um, for um, an older, uh, for a younger age group. Coping Power is anxiety based as well. And then the Resilience Education Program is uh, the program that works with students to kind of build those skills so they learn how to emotionally regulate and handle situations. Um, you know, when they're kind of faced with them over the, the course of their adolescence. And again, these are programs that are typically provided by school counselors in the school setting. Um, if a school does have a step team, like I mentioned previously, um, they would be providing these interventions as well. Signs of Suicide um, is a program that is a universal school-based program specifically designed for middle school ages um, and high school. And it the goals of the program honest, are, are truly to decrease suicide and suicide attempts by increasing the knowledge that our students have about um, just the attitudes and, and when they're experiencing depression. Um, we have been implementing signs of suicide in our schools um, for the last three or four years at a variety of different schools. Um, this might be a program that is available in your school. If it is not, it will be at some point as the goal is um, to roll this out for every school. Um, the counselor, again, would be the person who would know if your school is currently implementing this program. One of the great things about signs of suicide is they also have a parent um, component for this where parents can also receive kind of training um, that will help them kind of have some insight into what their kids are learning about. And it just helps us to reduce this stigma and mental illness. Um, one of the things we know with suicide prevention is that talking about suicide is the best way to prevent it. Um, so the goal of Signs of Suicide is to really get our youth talking about it, talking about their feelings and expressing when they are having those substantial feelings of of depression or suicide ideation so we can ensure that they get the help and the support that they need. Um, it, uh, on our team here at the Office of Prevention and Intervention, we have a group of clinicians that we refer to as prevention and intervention liaisons. Um, if you have had a situation with your children in their schools where they've needed some more intensive behavior health or just behavior support, you may have come across and met one of our liaisons. Um, our liaisons um, provide consultation and support to counselors and school teams around behavior health needs. They support um, school interventions at those tier two and tier three levels that I explained earlier. Um, they will help support schools with small group intervention. They help support the IBHS programs in schools. They also help coordinate what we call crisis response um, when a tragedy or something happens in the school or in the school community that's impacting our students and our families, they're there to coordinate that as well. They are a great resource. Um, we often pull them in. They have they will sit in meetings with families to ensure that families are receiving the support and services that they need. Um, so I just wanted to introduce you to who they were and that they exist um, and that they're just another level of support that we have in regard to um, meeting the social, emotional, and behavioral health needs of our of our kids, of our youth. So I know I've said this on probably every slide that I mentioned um, a different service. All of these services can be accessed by contacting your school counselor. Um, you should be able to contact your school counselor through a variety of measures. One could be calling the school directly, stopping in saying, I would like to talk to the counselor. A lot of our counselors have uh, websites that are embedded in their school's web pages. So if you go to your school's uh, web page, you might see like a counselor's corner or a counselor information section. Um, if you are not able to reach your counselor, you're like, I just don't know who that is. You can always ask your child's teacher. You can ask school administration, like this is a principal, the principal, school secretary. Um, at the end of these slides, I will show you how to access a list of all of our counselors in the School District of Philadelphia. It is a public list that is located on the School District of Philadelphia website where you can search for your school. It'll provide you with email contact for your counselor. So that's another way that you can get in touch with them. But Megan, mm -hmm. just to clarify, if they want to go in person to the school, they are allowed to do that to find the counselor? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And, and keep in mind, they might not be able to meet with you in a second. I know when I was a counselor in our schools for 13 years, when parents came in, I would try to drop everything and meet with them because I know it's not always easy for you all to get there. You have work schedules and, and such, but if they're busy, they will schedule a time to, to meet with you. But absolutely, if, if you're dropping your child off or you just happen to be in the area, stop in and say, I would like to speak to the counselor. Another great opportunity to speak with your counselor is doing report card conferences. I know they're happening this Friday. Um, counselors are available that whole day in your schools. That is a great time to have those conversations, especially if you're meeting with your child's teacher and they are expressing concerns. In that moment, you can say, I would like to talk to the counselor. Um, so that would be um, another way to kind of pull them in in the near future, um, but lots of ways to access them, yep. And then, um, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, if you are not really sure you want schools to be, uh, services, excuse me, to be provided in the school, you can always reach out to your insurance provider. Um, they can always help you connect you to community services, but please keep in mind that, that can be a very um, difficult thing to maneuver and figure out. Um, and even if you don't want services in the school, your counselor can also help connect you to services outside of school. So if you communicate to them, I'm not really sure I want my child to receive anything here, but I would like to be connected with an agency outside. The counselor can help you do that as well. They're, they're very used to walking families through this and explaining things and helping you with referrals and helping you understand the insurance piece. Um, so really lean on them if you need that, because I, I know that it can be a very overwhelming um, and confusing process when we're trying to get services for our students and for ourselves as, as adults as, as well. So thinking about that, I, I was wondering if anybody would be comfortable sharing what has been your experiencing, if you ha have had experience trying to access mental health or behavioral health services for yourself or for your child, um, what have your experiences been with accessing um, those type services? Um, you can feel free to share in the chat or um, unmute. I, I can share from personal experience with my daughter um, when she was in high school. She's now a freshman in college. When she was in high school, she was kind of going through a lot of things and, and we were really trying to get her linked with a psychiatrist um, to just really dig in and find out what was going on. And when I tell you the barriers I ran into, not only being able to identify a provider who was taking new patients, but then getting linked with the provider and finding out that there were six month wait lists, it, it was just, it was very frustrating. And, and it was scary because it was a time where she really needed somebody and she really needed to figure those things out. And what I can share is that it was hard. It took a lot of time, but we just kept looking and kept and, you know, eventually we were able to find someone and, and, and get her hand and get her get her the help that she needed. But I know that it can be very overwhelming and it can be stressful and you might run into a lot of barriers. Um, I also know folks that have great experiences when they're trying to access these services. Mm -hmm. um, but if anybody, you know, wants to share anything before we move on. We can also help you if you have a, uh, a child or a student who you know is struggling, but you're not sure where to go next, we can point you in the direction too. So this can also be like a, que a question answer with that as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe you don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to move on. We will have time if anybody thinks of something. This is not... The only time you can share. All right. Um, there may be times where your child might be experiencing what we call a crisis or a behavioral health emergency. That means that they are their behaviors or what they're experiencing is at such a significant level that we are concerned for their safety or potentially the safety of others. So I want to speak on how we kind of address that at the school level and what you can do um, if that's something that happens at, at home. 
So at the school level, when a student is experiencing a crisis and it's felt that they, um, you know, are a, a potential threat to their own safety or to the safety of others, our school counselors are trained to follow steps in a protocol that we call a behavioral health emergency protocol, where the counselor will, first of all, ensure that the student is safe. They will secure immediate safety for the student. They will make sure the student is never left alone. Um, and, you know, the primary goal is to keep the child safe. The, the counselor will then conduct what we call a risk assessment. Basically, it's a four or five questions that they will ask the student to try to assess how the student is feeling and what they're thinking about. Are they having suicidal or homicidal feelings? Um, when, how, how long have they been feeling this way? Have they had thoughts about harming themselves or someone else? Um, they'll ask some of those questions to get an idea of what the level of support is, is going to be needed. Um, what that then happens is they determine the level of risk. So they will, parents are involved in this process. Um, the counselors, you know, the school counselor and the school as a whole, primary goal is to contact the parent when these situations are, are occurring. So you can kind of talk through options and, and discuss what's going on. When a counselor determines a level of risk, they determine if it's routine, urgent, or emergent. Routine would mean, yes, your child is going through something. We don't think that it is an emergency, but we do recommend that they speak to someone and potentially receive some type of evaluation or assessment so they can get the supports and services that they need. We might recommend that they see someone within the next couple week or, or two weeks because we don't feel like it's something that um, is, is at a level of emergency. Urgent might mean that um, you know, there, there's a little bit more substantial concerns. Um, we might want you to see someone within 24 hours. And then emergent means that we have substantial concern for what um, your child is experiencing. Oh, and I should have went to the next slide because it explains it, shows it there, sorry. Emergent um, is that your child is expressing things that are making us feel that they are a threat to their own safety or safety of others. And that is when we're going to want you to act immediately. Acting immediately could mean um, going to an emergency room, going to a crisis center. If your child already has a provider or a therapist, it might mean just linking with them to receive an assessment. But um, it, it means that we are genuinely concerned and we want them to be seen right away. So there are the levels of risk that, um, that we um, determine when a child is experiencing. Um, thank you for sharing that in the chat and that is something that um, we can help support and get you connected um, to someone that can, can get you those resources because remember the resources that we can connect you with at the school can also help what's going what you're experiencing at home and going on at home as well. If you want to place in the chat what school you attend, that will help us even more because I can directly connect you with, I can connect you with the counselor myself. Um, so we do in the, uh, the Philadelphia City Philadelphia, we have three providers that will offer, offer mobile crisis support. You can see them listed here by zip code. These are clinicians that will actually come to the home and the school to assess a child in that moment and assist with supporting them to get services. If the child is um, considered safe to transport, they can figure out ways for transportation if you do not have that. Um, if the child is not considered safe, um, there are other measures that they can take to um, try to get the child to a facility so they can be evaluated. Um, the mobile crisis teams, so at the school setting, when a child has experienced a level of crisis that we think needs to be serviced or on the spot, the counselor or other staff will call you, the parent, and say, this is what's going on. We would like the mobile crisis team to come here and assess your child with your permission. We want you to actually come and be present when that happens. Sometimes you can't get there, which is fine, but we would need your consent. And then the mobile crisis team will come, they'll talk to your child, figure out what's going on, and then they will make a recommendation that you, the parent, would have to agree to for next steps. You can also contact Mobile Crisis at home. The phone number is the number that is there in the top right corner. 
Um, it is a city-based service. They are 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so this would be if, you know, your child is just really kind of going through some things and you're just put, you're just genuinely concerned for their safety or for the safety of others, you can call that hotline and they will send the crisis team to your home and they will do the assessment there just like they would do for us in school. Seems like we have some uh, conversation happening in the chat. We might want to pause and take a look at that. Hey, sure will. All right. Love the conversation in the chat, by the way. I really appreciate everybody giving some insight and advice in here. Oh, that's nice that others are offering suggestions. That's great. Oh, Farrell. Okay, awesome. So I can, um, once I get stop sharing, I'll be able to share who the counselor is and I can connect. Um, yeah, and I appreciate that others are um, sharing ways that they have kind of dealt with the same situation. Um, and, and our kids, there's a lot going on in, in, in this world right now and, you know, that our kids are, are impacted by. Um, and we all have to do what, what, what's best for our child and what's, what works for them. So I appreciate others sharing suggestions as well. Oh, we, yeah, we have some connections, some families that, that are both at Farrell, which is cool. And Farrell has some great counselors. I can share that as well. Yeah, maybe if we have multiple people at Farrell, at, uh, when we're ready, we can just share for everybody to see who the counselors at Farrell are. It might be Absolutely. helpful for the group. 100%. I'll actually show everybody how to find all the counselors, but uh, we'll definitely find that one specifically. All right. Um. Okay. In uh, the city of Philadelphia, we also have three crisis response centers. Um, you can always, if your child is ever, you know, experiencing a level of crisis, you can always take them to any emergency room, St. Christopher's, CHOP, you'll get the services that you need there. But um, in the uh, Philadelphia area, we do have um, three types of services that if your child is experiencing crisis, you can go to for support. Both the crisis response center, which you see in the first block, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, Behavior Health and Crisis Center, which is the third block, they will provide psychiatric evaluation and make recommendations for care, um, including if your child needs to be hospitalized immediately. They're open 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, they are great um, services that, that you can utilize at any time if you need. The PATH Urgent Care Center, which is the middle block, um, they provide similar services to the Crisis Response Center and CHOP, but they have hours of operation. So they are open uh, Mondays through Friday, uh, Monday through Friday from 11 to 6 p.m. They are closed on holidays and things of that nature. So um, they are only, um, you know, they don't have the 24 hours, seven days a week like the other two centers do. But all three of these are a great resource to use if you have genuine concerns about what your child might be experiencing. Um, the other great thing about these three centers is that they will ask you for permission to um, collaborate with your counselor at your school. So if you bring your child to be seen because they are experiencing things that are also impacting them at the school level, um, they, with your permission, will communicate um, with the schools as well. And then just a few additional resources I want to share with you during our time today. There is something in the Philadelphia area called the Philly Hope Line. This is a combined effort between the School District of Philadelphia and Uplift Center for Grieving Children. It is free. It's confidential. It is a helpline that is ran by um, clinicians that specialize in grief and loss that can also support um, emotional situations that you might be going through. Um, they offer... They also have dedicated service hours for Spanish speakers and for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and they also have an interpretation line that will support over 150 different language needs. So this is a great resource um, to call. Their hours are right there um, on the slide. Um, they do have some evening hours. Um, they're just, they can kind of just hear you out, listen about what's going on. And then they can connect you to additional services. They can connect you to service in your school. They can connect you to service in your community, whatever it is that you might need. And maybe you just need somebody to talk to. They're great for that as well. 
And then some additional resources uh, that are specific to the school district and our partners that I want to share at the top, that is me. I am Megan Smith, the Deputy of Prevention and Intervention. Um, if you run into any barriers um, accessing your school counselor or services in your schools, you can 100% feel free um, to reach out to me. Um, Dr. Stacey Clark, I thought I removed that. She's no longer with us, so I'm going to remove that. So please do not pay attention to that one. Um, the Office of Prevention and Intervention, that is our direct email address. Again, that will connect you to one of our staff. Um, you can reach out to that if you are trying to access mental health services, you don't know where to start. If you are trying to get services in the school and you're not successful, um, if you have a child that's experiencing something and you just want to talk it through with somebody because you're not sure what to do next, that is a great way to get kind of some immediate uh, support and response. Um, also linked there is our behavioral health emergency protocol, which I mentioned. Um, that is really the tool that our schools kind of use when a student is experiencing crisis. And then I also linked um, our school counselors, which I'm going to um, show you. I'm actually going to show you how to access the counselors on the school district website, though, because I like that better. But that link there is a list of our counselors um, and also some of the community resources. I mentioned Community Behavior Health, which is CBH. They are the provider here in the city of Philadelphia that oversees all of our mental health providers. Um, and there's more information there about the IBHS services and um, ABA services or applied behavioral analysis tend to be services specific to students who are on the autism spectrum, um, but they're similar to IBHS. So I just wanted to close and, and ask you just to think about like, what is something new that you learned? Um, and what is something that you used to think about, but now we've kind of changed your thinking just through some of the information and things that um, we have shared with you this morning. And you can just think about it. You can put it in the chat. You can verbally share. It's completely up to you. Yes, the school counselors are definitely who you want to check in with. And they can support um, not just behavioral and mental health needs, but if your child is also experiencing some academic concerns, they can help in that way as well as well as for college and career readiness. So I'm actually going to stop sharing real quick um, because you know, I want to sh just show how they can find their counselor on the school district web page. This is our school district website. Easiest way is to go to the little search magnifying glass thingy over here and you can probably type in school counselors and look where it first takes you to the family and community engagement page. Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the areas where you can find a counselor list. So I'm actually gonna click that one just because it came up first. And on this page, which is wonderful, it says get the help you need. And if you see the counselor tab here, you can click counselor and there's actually a directory I thought that takes us to ours. All right, we're going to go my way then. Sorry about that. One second. Do we have to update that, Sheila? So we're going to focus on that. Yeah, I'm going to. Oh, wait, here it is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we are. I should have scrolled down a little bit more. So as you can see, um, here's the school counselor directory. So if we put in, is Farrell two or one or two? Looks like there. it's two. So I didn't even have to type the whole name. I just typed in a few letters and up popped the three counselors at Farrell. If you do not know which counselor is yours, what I do know is that they split grade bands. So they have like a K to two counselor, like a three to five and a six to eight. If that is not something that you are aware of, you can email any of them or all three of them and, and just say, hey, I'm trying to identify which one is the counselor for my child. Or like we mentioned, you can stop in at the school, you can ask your child's teacher. I know a lot of teachers um, and counselors communicate through like Class Dojo and other apps, uh, texting apps. Um, but that is the easiest way you can find your counselor. So you can type in any school right there and it will give you the list of counselors um, in those schools. So it's a, it's a great way, um, one of the easiest way to, to find them. 
Um, and since we are on the school district website, um, if you happen to recall the name of our office, which is Prevention and Intervention. Oh, let me go back. Why is my thing going so slow? In that search bar, again, if you were to put in the name of my office, which comes right up, Prevention Intervention, and you go to our office space page, what you will find is we have all a lot of those resources I've already reviewed with you are listed here. So we have a 504 inquiry form. So if you think maybe a 504 might be good for your child and you're not sure how to start, you can submit that form. There's actually a way to contact your student school counselor. All those crisis resources I talked about are there. We also have a resources tab that lists the 988 suicide call and text line. You can text 988 24 hours a day, seven days a week, call, text, and you will be linked with a trained counselor who can help you work through a crisis. Um, lots of different local resources that are on here. Philly Hope Line is there that I already mentioned. That crisis line is there. Um, so lots of great resources on our page. And then the contact us, again, shows you a way um, if you forget that email that I had in the slides, this is another way that you can get uh, directly in contact with us and we can get you the help and support that you need.